Welcome to Walden Pod, I'm your host, Emerson Green. So, an argument that some animal rights activists will defend, though in my experience it seems to be more commonly defended by the opponents of animal rights, is that we should, as a matter of consistency, try to intervene in wild animal suffering. Well, if I take a vegan's moral principles seriously, then why should my concerns stop with industrial farming? Wild animals arguably have it just as bad, if not much worse, than farmed animals, so a consistent vegan would try to stop predators from eating animals. The argument is that if the ethical principles espoused by animal welfare advocates are applied consistently, then they'd be committed to intervening in nature, trying to prevent predators from killing and eating prey, for instance. But that's absurd, so we can reject the principles defended by vegans and vegetarians. It's crazy to stop a lion from eating a gazelle, so I can go to McDonald's later guilt-free. At least that's how it tends to go with the opponents of animal rights. It's a reductio meant to invalidate vegan moral principles. But there are many vegans who argue that we ought to reduce wild animal suffering as well. The argument is kind of similar in both cases. It's just that these general principles that make us concerned with animal welfare shouldn't be arbitrarily limited to animals that aren't living in the wild. And as I said, there seem to be two basic groups of people who are advancing this kind of argument. People who are trying to show that the principles espoused by animal rights activists lead to absurdity, and people who are earnestly trying to inspire action to help alleviate wild animal suffering. I think there are many things wrong with this general line of argument. First off, it's not clear that a consistent vegan, deeply concerned with the suffering of animals, should feel rationally compelled to intervene in wild animal suffering. Of course, it's true that predation, starvation, and so on have been responsible for an unimaginable amount of suffering, but that's not within our power to prevent. Human beings are responsible for the existence of factory farming, and it's entirely within our power to bring that to an end. Unlike industrial farming, predation, starvation, parasitism, and so on did not result from decisions made by human beings. So one could argue that since we're not responsible for it, we don't have an obligation to solve it. Secondly, they could argue that it's not within our power to ameliorate it even if we decided to do something about it. So, ought implies can is a plausible moral principle. If you can't do it, then you're not obligated to do it. For instance, no one can find fault in you for failing to do something that would be physically impossible. Even if that action would be a good thing to do, it doesn't make any sense to say you ought to do that. Ought implies can. And in the absence of some very surprising future technology, we cannot end animal predation. For the sake of argument, let's say such technology did arrive. Gene editing is more and more of a reality, and gene drives make it possible to alter the genetic character of entire populations relatively quickly. It's not as if it would violate the laws of physics to alter the genes of predators so that their physical and psychological attributes were not aimed at savagely killing and eating other sentient creatures. It's science fiction-y, but it's not impossible. However, we can't end animal predation without causing a massive disruption in the ecosystem. We're talking about drastically altering central attributes of a very complex, dynamic, interconnected, highly emergent system. Even if eliminating predation was realistic, eliminating predation and expecting everything else to remain fixed in place is fairly absurd. It would make the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs look like a footnote in Earth's history. One of the lessons of climate change, I thought, was that relatively subtle changes, like slightly altering the composition of the atmosphere, could lead to dramatic consequences. Given the interconnectedness of the natural order, waving a technological wand and eliminating predation would plausibly cause the entire system to collapse into non-existence. It would be like surgically removing the spine of an elephant and expecting everything else to carry on as before. Even if eliminating predation while still feeding predators was realistic, doing so and expecting everything else to remain fixed in place is not. It's unfortunate that God, in his infinite wisdom, designed a biological order with evil built into the very structure of creation, but it's not within our power to bring an end to predation. It is within our power to bring an end to an unusual cultural practice that didn't exist until somewhat recently, Factory farming. What's more, we're actually responsible for that.
My instincts are that human intervention in nature is guilty until proven innocent. A very high bar has to be met, and this can probably only be achieved in cases of relatively minor alleviations of wild animal suffering. I'm not against the idea in principle. Many of the arguments against intervention in wild animal suffering are not good. I haven't even touched on the most common objections to it, because they're mostly terrible. I agree with Peter Singer, who argued that, quote, if it is in our power to prevent something bad from happening, without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, we ought morally to do it. I just don't think it's within our power to do it, and neither to Singer. Quote, For practical purposes, I'm fairly sure, judging from man's past record of attempts to mold nature to his own aims, that we would be more likely to increase the net amount of animal suffering if we interfered with wildlife than to decrease it. For me, this is the main argument. Aldo Leopold, the American conservationist and environmentalist, summarized the concern like this at the end of a Sand County Almanac. In short, a land ethic changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members, and also respect for the community as such. In human history, we have learned, I hope, that the conqueror role is eventually self defeating. Why? because it is implicit in such a role that the conqueror knows, ex cathedra, just what makes the community clock tick, and just what and who is valuable, and what and who is worthless in community life. It always turns out that he knows neither, and this is why his conquests eventually defeat themselves. The ordinary citizen today assumes that science knows what makes the community clock tick. The scientist is equally sure that he does not. He knows that the biotic mechanism is so complex that its workings may never be fully understood. Thank you for listening. I've been Emerson Green, and I'll talk to you next time.